Hello and welcome to BST Live, the show for systematic and algorithmic traders. Glad you could join us today, where we're going to be talking about crypto. Now, obviously, crypto is a hot topic now and has been for the last few years. So uh, we've been a little bit slow to have a crypto discussion on the show. But today we have a, uh, I like to think he's a crypto specialist, Brian Landon from Market Science. Welcome, Brian. Glad you could join us today. Happy to be here. <laughs> Usually people don't like it when I call them specialists, but uh, I've seen some of your work and I think it's uh, fantastic. And we're going to be uh, talking a lot about crypto and um, statistical edges in the crypto markets today. And we've got um, some people on the chat who are also keen to ask you some questions. So right. um, before we get started into uh, talking about crypto, how about we talk a little bit about your background and how you got started in trading? Sure. So. My background is originally in mechanical engineering, uh, my undergrad, and then I recently completed a master's degree in data science. I got interested in trading around 2015 or so, like right around the time I graduated college. I was just looking at ETFs and options for the most part. I had read a lot on trend following and momentum, and that's kind of where I got started. And then around the summer or maybe spring of 2017, heard a lot about Bitcoin and crypto more generally, and it was uh, pretty exciting. There was a lot of hype. That was the first real bull market that I experienced. And so really delved deep into that because I saw crypto as an asset class, which was not really anchored to any fundamental value per se. Uh, There's a lot of speculation as to what some fundamental values could be. But for the most part, it was an asset class driven mainly by speculation. And for that reason, I thought it was the most ripe for market analysis and trading because uh, anomalies and mispricings arise when it's just mainly people speculating and selling based on emotion or just their subjective interpretation of value rather than something more concrete. And so I thought it was a good place to get started as a retail trader or someone mm. without huge amounts of capital. Yeah. Well, it does uh, sound like there's a lot of potential there. I think we hear a lot of things in the news about crypto, and we're going to talk about um, some of those statistical edges uh, today. But um, uh, before we get into that, are you, do you just trade cryptos or are you trading other markets as well? Almost entirely crypto. Um, I maintain a retirement portfolio and manage that, I wouldn't say actively, but uh, somewhat actively. And then mm. market major market dislocations, like I traded equities and some options during March of last year when a lot of things got way out of line. I think there was a lot of forced selling and liquidations and things just kind of went crazy in the markets uh, right as COVID was starting. And I haven't really touched it since. Mm, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's get started in crypto then, because I've got a load of questions for you today. So okay. um, I guess, <laughs> I, I guess um, you know, compared to other markets, crypto is is quite a new market. And you know, typically traders when they um, they look to get into a new market, they do some um, you know some general research and, and get a feel for the market and figure out the things that they need to know before they. Uh, start building strategies and putting money on the line in that market. So, um, you know, what what kinds of things do you think traders need to be aware of uh, before they jump into crypto or, or they think about building strategies for crypto markets? Um, I think one of the things that probably separates crypto as a market from more traditional classes is one, it's much more decentralized, and I don't mean that in the sense of like the protocols are decentralized, but there's probably dozens, maybe hundreds of different crypto exchanges. And so the first thing you have to decide on if you want to trade is where you're going to be actually trading. And so there's a few major market players, um, but it's different from, say, futures or options where there's basically just one or two major exchanges that you would be trading on. And the what goes along with that as well is that there is less regulation in the space. I mean, there's definitely it's come a long way in the past few years, but 
there's counterparty risk where if you decide to trade on some offshore exchange, which maybe isn't very liquid or has a lot of regulatory oversight, there's a very real possibility that uh, your funds could just be lost. Uh, there's several instances of high profile exchange hacks or mishaps where all of the exchange users' money was either taken by hackers um, or just went missing. And the nature of crypto means that that's really not ever coming back to you uh, once it's transferred out to someone else's wallet. If someone gets access to the exchange wallets and transfers it out, uh, that is irreversibly gone. So mm -hmm. counterparty risk is a big factor. Uh, there's some big exchanges, uh, Coinbase, Binance, are two of the biggest ones. FTX also is a, like a new up and coming one. And then there's, like I said, dozens of other exchanges that people can trade on. Mm, yeah. So, um, okay, so let's just talk about this uh, decentralization and the impact to data, because obviously as uh, algorithmic traders and, and um, mm. you know, some of the statistical techniques that, you, that we're going to talk about uh, very soon, you need to have data. Um, and with decentralized um, exchanges, the data can be different, prices can be different. How do you go about choosing which um, exchanges and which data you should use for, uh, for your testing? So personally, I'd focus on the largest, most liquid exchanges when I'm gathering data. I mean, there's people who aggregate data from literally everywhere. There's data services that just scrape as much data as they can from all the various exchanges. Um, but typically, focus on the most liquid futures exchanges and most liquid spot exchanges. So really, if you capture data from one or two or three of each of them, you'll have a pretty good sense of what the price is at. Uh, kind of going back to the last point, there's no one price per se. Um, like if, if you try to get the price of a Bitcoin, there's really no standard price. There's no uh, NBBO or uh, anything similar like that in crypto. So you really just have to either get data from the exchange that you plan on trading on, which is a hmm. good approach, or just aggregate from a few large liquid exchanges, and that should give a pretty good sense of what the true price is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then as far as data uh, history, obviously um, some cryptos haven't been around for that long and some have a little bit more history. Um, and you're testing, testing statistical methods, you need to have enough data for significance, statistical significance. How do, you, um, how do you manage the length of data versus what you're trying to test? So, I mean, this is, I, I don't know if there's real good objective metrics or anything for this. For the majority of the work that I do, I typically pick uh, 2017 or sometimes a little earlier as a starting point. Uh, and the reason for that is that it's really around the time when the market shifted from mainly spot-based exchanges as a main liquidity source and where most of the activity and price discovery happened to futures and what's called perpetual swaps exchanges. Um, and so I think the price activity really changed around that time because you introduced the effects of liquidations and forced selling and buying, which kind of defined the price behavior for a long time. So that's, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's really not a very long sample. Uh, as of right now, that's only four years or so, not even. But mm. things also move very quickly in the crypto space. If you were to just look at Bitcoin in particular, since its inception, it's gone through, uh, I don't know offhand, but probably four or five complete bull and bear cycles, which are things that typically take decades to play out in equity or other traditional markets. So there's less data in an absolute sense, but it still yeah. can give you enough confidence and especially that you see patterns play out pretty consistently. Mm, yeah. So as far as, I guess, uh, selecting the cryptos that are worth uh, further research and uh, for trading, 
Um, you know, I don't know the exact number of cryptos available at the moment. It's probably hundreds, maybe. <laughs> maybe you know the exact uh, yeah, number. But... More, oh, I, I don't even. There's so many being introduced all the time. I yeah. don't even know if it's possible to get an accurate number. There's a few sites, uh, CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap, that try and aggregate everything, but there are almost too many to count. Mm. So, so there's probably only maybe a handful that are actually worth uh, trading. Perhaps I'm, I'm not sure. How do you go about choosing which ones are even worth the time and effort to investigate for trading edges? So I think it depends on your time frame, but mainly it's an issue of liquidity. Um, for uh, most of the crypto pairs, a lot of the smaller ones, if you're trying to trade actively there generally isn't enough liquidity to put on much size uh, and it, like and to do it with high turnover so like a lot of the smaller market cap coins or tokens if you even try and put a market order in for 20 or fifty thousand dollars you're probably going to move the price by at least a few percentage points so it's very significant amounts of slippage um, so I think the strategy that a lot of people use is either to adapt sort of a market making approach where you're not aggressively taking liquidity or just uh, setting resting limit offers and trying to do that or just accumulating slowly over time so you don't really affect the price. But other than that, I think at any time there's probably 20 to 50 or so depending on market conditions, but products where you can actually enter and exit positions with enough liquidity that you're not going to distort the market price too badly. Hmm. And that would really be the main consideration. Yeah, okay. All right, well, let's dig into um, the, I guess, the uh, finding edges and statistical uh, techniques in, in uh, crypto. So, um, in your research, what are some of the common factors that you found um, actually move the, the markets in crypto or, or show some statist statistical edge in crypto? I think the first place that anyone could start would just be looking at traditional momentum or trend following methods. And it seems like they work pretty well on most time frames. Um, so crypto is a very momentum driven market. And so Typically what happens is, is that buying begets more buying. And as people are noticing that prices are increasing, that typically attracts attention, causing more people to buy. And that, um, that phenomenon can persist for a while. And then typically you'll reach some point where valuations get stretched or people are, usually you just see a crazy run up and then People tend to do the same in reverse, where once people start selling, uh, that selling gets more selling because now people who had ridiculous profits are locking them in. And so mm -hmm. that kind of tumbles back down the other direction. So I think momentum, first of all, would be your main edge. Or I mean, it could be an edge. It's, it's just something that seems to have worked well for as long as I've been involved in the markets. Um, other edges that Typically, I mean, they dimin they've diminished over time, but arbitrage is always an option that's on the table. So because of the number of exchanges that are available, there are, you know, probably dozens of prices for any given asset at any time. And so if there's different prices for the same product on different exchanges, then you can buy the cheaper one and sell the more expensive one and capture the spread between the two. That I, that has been employed by a lot of people. And so I think there's a lot of very sophisticated firms trying to do that at the moment. So it's not as juicy as it might've been at one time, but that's, it's always an option just because of the number of exchanges. Mm -hmm. And then other than that, I think, I mean, we, at market science, we tend to look at uh, like price anomalies or things that tend to happen on a routine basis. And so that includes looking at time of day effects or seasonality effects. So you can see that 
thing um, price tends to move a certain way on different times of day. And there's also weekend effects. So because crypto trades 24 seven, there's typically a lot, uh, a lot less volume that happens on the weekends, similar to, uh, I'm not sure how many other exchanges or products trade over the weekend, but that's something to look at. So with the reduced trading activity, you usually see reduced volatility. So that's something to look at. And then same, um, same effect happens at different times of day as well. So during the American trading hours and European trading hours are typically increased activity and with that increased volatility and then it tends to drop off uh, after those sessions. So those are things you mm -hmm. can look at. Yeah, okay. So, um, so firstly on this uh, momentum and trend following, um, we often hear these stories about the markets, you know, uh, 30 years ago where really basic techniques work. You could just follow a moving average and make a ton of money. And I, I think, you know, back then um, from a like a technology point of view, the markets were less sophisticated than now. But what, what do you see in crypto? Do you see like um, some of these really basic techniques that worked in other markets 20, 30 years ago at work now? Or, or are we at a different level because you know, there's a lot of machine learning and AI and we've got instant news and all kinds of stuff these days that, that can impact all markets. So do you see any of these older older techniques working these days or is, have we already moved on from that in the crypto markets? No, I think there is a lot of very simple, and I haven't, I mean, I haven't looked at, you know, strategy decay or anything super closely over the last year maybe, but I think that old strategies definitely can still work. Uh, there's there's a lot of old trading books and that's kind of how I got a start with a lot of things. There's a, plenty of trading books that have been written over the years by traders that you've had on the show. And you can just go and code up like very simple strategies and just see how they work. And a lot of the times, you know, there might be something there. It's not going to be the world's best strategy, but typically um, things that were profitable, especially especially like in the futures markets decades ago, um, equities are kind of a different story, but a lot of those strategies still tend to work pretty well. I'd say you could, you could literally just use moving averages or, you know, Donchian channel breakout or something like that and have some success. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, yeah, one of the other uh, um, factors, I guess you, you mentioned there was uh, um, seasonality, like time of day, day of week type of stuff. And, you know, what I think is one of the interesting points about crypto is that it's 24 hour a day, trades over the weekends. I don't know any other markets that, that do that. Um, so what, what kind of things to, have you noticed with time and day and day of the week, um, you know, with sessions that just go, you know, 24 seven essentially? Yeah. So I think the big ones, like I discussed, um, I think that directionality, like we do look at it, um, just looking at, you know, different days of the week, how they perform. So you could see like what's the average performance, like return or sharp ratio, however you want to measure it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday versus other days of the week. But I think that's that generally leads to some pretty spurious uh, results just because those don't seem to be as persistent as other metrics. So I, I don't know, it's tough to recommend strategies that would be centered around you know buying on monday or buying on tuesday or something like that i think it's more useful for looking at activity or price ranges so i think a good place to start with a lot of systems especially on lower time frames is trying to figure out how much price is going to move in a given day or trading session whenever if you're trading intraday like whatever session you're looking at and so on weekdays, those ranges are typically larger um, and on weekends are typically smaller just because volume and volatility are very well correlated. And then there's other effects like, um, so the daily open is typically at midnight UTC time. So where I'm at, that's five hours uh, before midnight. And 
I think there's, a, well, I'm not sure exactly why, but I think there's a lot of automated strategies that trade on a daily time frame, or just a lot of things that rebalance on a daily time frame. So you'll see at that daily open right around midnight UTC, a lot of activity comes in. So that's almost always the most traded highest volume hour of the day, even though it doesn't really correspond with any, like it's not a traditional market open in any market that I'm aware of, but you'll see a lot of orders come in and for like scalpers or like really low time frame traders, that could be a good time uh, to trade inefficiencies because there's just a lot of blind flow that's uh, trying to execute orders based on, you know, the next day's signal, whatever that may be. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. that's something to look at. Yeah. And I, and I assume you probably see some of that, um, that increase in, in volume at the start of different sessions throughout the day, right? Like as Asia comes online and then the UK and Europe. So yeah, have you noticed anything? Yeah. It's tough though. I think, I mean, I think generally speaking, that's true. So there's more market activity in the American and European hours, but I've looked at it a few times and there's no, other than the UTC open, which is like the official open for the crypto markets. Like I wouldn't say there's many individual times where it's like people are sitting down at their desks and waiting for the open. I think even talking to some of the prop traders that I know, uh, it's typically not as structured as it would be for an equity desk or a more traditional product. It's a lot more people who are trading kind of their own schedule or they find a session that works well for them. And so it's a much more of a gradual ramp up and ramp down in activity. Mm, yeah. Okay. Um, so you also mentioned a little bit earlier about uh, patterns or repeatable patterns. Can you uh, give us some indications of the types of things you look for outside of, you know, what we've just discussed about time and day and day of week, but uh, are there any other kind of repeat repeatable patterns you're looking at or looking for? So I don't, I mean, like I've said, I've, I've tested out um, a few like pattern based strategies and I've also used uh, Dave Bergstrom's build alpha software, which I think you've had uh, Dave on a few times. Yeah. And so th that, that looks at, you know, candle structure or just different patterns that occur in the price. So those are things to try like, and there's very simple things that work well too. I think when people ask like the one bread and butter strategy, is just like a three candle uh, triangle breakout, which is just like if there is a inside, if there's a daily bar where uh, the high of the day is lower than the three day high and the low of the day is higher than the three day low, you can just basically set a breakout order for that three day high. And that's worked basically since I've started testing. But the majority of what I do now, uh, uses machine learning approaches. So rather than trying to code up and try and use human logic to specify patterns, it's more focused on feeding in relevant variables. So things about market price behavior or sentiment or liquidations or open interest that have predictive value and then using some uh, machine learning or statistical learning algorithm to make sense of it. Mm, yeah. Okay. Well, what about uh, volatility then? So obviously uh, the crypto market can be pretty volatile. We hear it in the news all the time when it's gone up mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's fallen down. How does that impact the, the types of statistical edges that you look at? Well, I think uh, first, I mean, the volatility of the markets I think is, more of a feature than a bug. I think volatility is what traders seek out because if prices aren't moving, you really can't make any money. Um, so I think for the most part, volatility is a positive aspect in the market. I think some of the volatility that gets that's the most newsworthy are what I was describing earlier, which is our the big force liquidation events. And I don't, uh, in the past few months or so, I can't really think of any huge newsworthy events that have happened, but 
there's been plenty of times when the market will just kind of be hovering around a range, you know, volatility will be, volatility is always pretty high. It's probably in the hundred ish percent annualized range, which is way higher than most traditional markets. But then there'll just be random days where the price of an asset could drop 30, 40, 50% in a matter of 24 hours. And it's typically caused by people who are using leverage. And because of the fact that the exchanges have to implement their own liquidation uh, algorithms on their own, it means that if you're using leverage on an exchange, the exchanges will just liquidate your positions for you if you exceed your margin requirements. Mm. So if a lot of people have over leveraged positions as the market starts going against them, they'll all be forced to sell. And so what happens is the exchanges will create market orders or limit orders in some cases on their behalf. And then prices will just keep moving down because basically no one is buying. There's no liquidity on the other side of the book. And all mm. of these orders to sell are hitting in one direction and liquidity basically evaporates until finally someone, usually a large, uh, well-capitalized trader or institution or someone steps in and realizes that prices are overextended and they start bidding it up the other way. So that's, I think that's, that's really the volatility that you have to worry about are the huge flash crashes. Like flash crashes, I would say happen pretty frequently in crypto markets, just because of the, like that mechanism where you can just have huge, what are called liquid liquidation cascades where people liquidating their positions just cause more liquidations. Yeah. Yeah. I guess there's a couple of impacts of that on um, trading, first of all, from the risk management side. And also, um, you know, if you're doing statistical testing, uh, you've got to have some uh, assumptions in there for slippage, but it could be hard mm. to measure. So, I mean, what do you do in that situation? How do you include slippage? What, you know, how do you, how do you even measure that kind of thing to add into your quant studies? Um, I think it's, I think it helps to be active in the market and kind of see what goes on because um, the first aspect from a data perspective, there are a lot of days where you'll have huge price wicks where it just looks like the market dropped by 30 or so percent and then rebounded immediately or on an intraday basis where price will just um, drop by, you know, five, 10 percent and then stay at that depressed level for a few minutes and then just rapidly shoot right back to where it started from. And so in most traditional markets, if you're looking at the data, you would think that those are just outliers or that you know your data is bad. But uh, if you're watching it live, you know that those events really do happen and you have to treat those as serious possibilities. Um, so it, it's, what it does do is make it more difficult to set stops or have strategies with defined risk because if you are holding a position during one of those events and you have a stop loss set somewhere in that range where the liquidation happens, you could have uh, a liquidation cascade that goes way past your um, stop where you have a stop set and because mm there's no bid on the other side. It will just keep trading lower and lower without any trades actually executed. And so you end up with, you could potentially end up with some pretty massive slippage. Um, there's also rumors of like stop hunting or stop targeting where members of the exchange or people with inside access to the order flow of the exchange know where people's stops are being placed and so they will purposely trigger these events to happen where they'll just go after people's stops if they know there's a lot of stops in their location because it'll cause these huge dislocations to happen but mm -hmm. i think it's just something to be aware of if you're doing back testing or trying to 
set your transaction costs or try and estimate your slippage, I would definitely be generous with your slippage. Don't assume that you're always going to get in for a few percent um, or not a few percent, but like a few basis points or something like that. Like it's hmm. pretty safe to assume some healthy slippage, especially if you're doing like a breakout strategy or you're using a lot of stop market orders in your strategy that those could very well execute well away from where you expect them to. Yeah, okay. Uh, we've got a couple of questions here in the chat. Uh, we'll start with Matt because he's asking about statistics, which we're kind of just talking about here. Thanks for the question, Matt. Are the stats that you're looking at similar to more traditional futures, uh, for example, ES and NASDAQ index stats? For example, um, IB on, P I don't know what that on PD means, um, high, low touches, or are there crypto specific stats that you're looking at? Um, I think IB is initial balance, if I'm not mistaken. And I am not sure what ON, PD, high, low touches are. That might be overnight sessions. So I think these are market oh, yeah. profile terms. And uh, okay, overnight prior day. Yeah. Um, I did briefly look into some market profile and uh, volume profile strategies, but I don't implement many of them. Um, or I don't have any systems based around them. It's more so it just reading into it uh, helped me improve my understanding of the market, I guess, like thinking of the market as a auction process, but no, those are not, uh, those are not really stats that I've looked at. Mm, yeah. Okay. Um, we've got, <coughs> excuse me, we've got a few more questions here, actually. They're starting to flow now. Um, this is one I was going to ask a bit later, but let's have a look at it now. I think it's uh, good timing from RDE. Thanks for the question. What language or software stack are you using for backtesting and what exchange are you trading on? So um, almost everything I do is written in Python. Um, don't really use much else. There's a lot of good open source libraries that are written in Python, um, depending on what you want to do, especially for easier strategies and things like that. There's some pretty good plug and play open source packages where you can do your back testing and then some of them allow you to actually go live and execute. And exchanges, I've used a few, um, but the big ones at the moment are FTX and Binance. And then I also, uh, for fiat onboarding and offboarding, use uh, Coinbase. Mm. When you're testing these um, strategies or the statistical uh, techniques, are you using spot um, prices or futures prices? I typically use futures prices. Um, I don't know. I've tried a few approaches. They're usually pretty close. And um, if there's a market that has perpetual swaps, which are like futures, for people who aren't familiar, they're like futures contracts that expire every eight hours or so. Some of them are what are supposed to be continuously expiring, but they're set up so that they track the spot price very closely. And if they get too far out of line, um, there's a funding mechanism that basically Draw brings them back to spot. Okay, thanks for that one, uh, Brian. Here's a question from Dean, or uh, De might be Deanne. I'm not sure. Apologies for that if I got it wrong. What, what criteria do you use for selecting cryptocurrencies? Well, actually, I have a screener set up at the moment that looks at um, basically comes up with a set of metrics for all of the most liquid traded, most liquid traded products on exchanges. And I'm looking at the predicted uh, direction, the predicted volatility or range, and the predicted trendiness or you know opposite of choppiness for an asset. And so that narrows down the lists. And then more recently, I've started to implement uh, like a catalyst or a sector or theme-based approach where 
you can kind of see if you stay on top of sentiment or just trends on social media or just keep your ear to the ground, I guess, different sectors of the crypto industry or different themes or catalysts within the industry tend to dare, or, uh, dominate the narrative at any time. And so you can see capital kind of rotate from one theme to another. So if anyone's been paying attention to the space recently, the big theme at the moment is NFTs and or gaming or anything around those. So most of the currencies or tokens that are exposed to those themes have been performing well. Um, and then for the past year or so, especially last summer, decentralized finance or DeFi was the big theme or all the rage. So that was a good sector to be in. So you can apply like a discretionary overlay or just focus on a sector or two that maybe don't have like very objective metrics around, but you know, like that's where all the hype and activity is. So that's, that's how I've been making more of my decisions. So that's, I mean, it's still just an overlay though. If, if the mm -hmm. other indicators are what you're tracking looks like garbage, that's still probably not a great bet, even if it's in a hot sector. Mm, yeah. There's a, a follow-up question from Dean. Uh, let me put this one up on the screen. How a liquid a coin are you prepared to trade? Uh, dep depends on <laughs> how illiquid it is defined. I mean, if I can't get into it or out of it without sacrificing a few percentage points, I, that's not something I'm really interested in. Um, so I don't know. It's it's tough because I think a lot of people who are coming at it from a stocks perspective or you know big liquid markets might look at something that trades a million dollars in volume <clears throat> in a day and say there's no way mm -hmm. I would ever come near this thing. But I don't know. I'm working. I'm working on right now trying to define liquidity for all the coins in the space, because I think a lot of people tend to look at order book volume as a measure of liquidity, but there's a lot of, like there's no spoofing regulations or any, there's a lot of kind of questionable stuff that happens in crypto trading where the volume or the uh, liquidity you see in the order books isn't actually there. And especially it's not there when you need it most. So, what you can do is, is what I'm trying to implement is look at how much a given or how much uh, volume it takes for an asset to move by a certain percentage. So if you look and say, um, like over some time period, this coin traded $2 million in volume and it only moved half a percent, that would be more liquid than something that traded $10,000 in volume and that moved price half a percent. But I don't know. I, I don't have any rigid thresholds in place at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, why don't we talk about um, a little bit more about, uh, I guess, some of the concerns that you, you mentioned just then about the crypto markets, and that is the security of funds, how safe your money is. We got a question here from Jeff. Do you think your money is safe at unregulated brokers like Binance? Uh, I think it, it's a good mindset to have that your money is never safe completely at, you know, unregulated brokers. And that's another nice thing uh, about leverage in the space is that you're not required to keep all of your money on exchange. So if you have a $100,000 trading account, but you have access to 20x or 50x, whatever leverage, you can take position size is proportional to the amount of money you actually have and are willing to trade and put a fraction of that on account. So if something happens, uh, either due to regulatory measures or a hack or some something else nefarious, uh, you only lose a fraction of what you actually have in your account. And then um, I think that's usually the best way and then other than that, if you have the infrastructure to do it or the capability or just the ability to keep track of everything, you can also use multiple exchanges 
and help to minimize your counterparty risk that way. So where you don't have one central point of failure. So if one exchange goes down, you know, you're not losing your entire balance. Mm, yep. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Brian. Here is a question from Colin. G'day, Colin. What kind of balance do you have between spreading versus concentrating your bets in the universe of tokens? And uh, what kind of performance metrics do you use to track strategy performance? Yeah, strategy performance, yeah. <laughs> so I don't do much spreading per se. Um, it's I would say it's pretty concentrated, um, especially, yeah, I, I think that's, that's pretty fair. Um, if it is a spread position, it's pretty incidental. So if something is a good short setup, you know, if there's one asset that has a good short setup and another one that has a good long setup, like that wouldn't be an explicit spread, but I might be long and short at the same time. Or I could have four long positions and two short positions, something like that. But it's not something that I would put on as a spread trade per se. And then the second part, uh, performance metrics. Yep. So to track strategy performance live, um, usually looking at the difference between back-tested performance or the model's predicted performance or how what the model predicted versus the actual live. And then for actual strategy performance for back testing and things like that, I usually just use sharp ratio. Uh, I have a I have a blog post or a, I think a series of blog posts written about it on quantfiction.com. But essentially what I did was look at the actual performance metric which I care about. And so that would be the amount of return versus the drawdown incurred, because I think that's usually what most traders actually care about on a gut level. Like if they're watching their screens, they care about how much they're making and they care about how much they can lose at any given time, like how much they can actually stomach losing in order to uh, get those returns. And then drawdown itself yeah. isn't actually, I don't think it's helpful to think about it as a single variable because it's very path dependent. So if you have a distribution of returns, that same distribution of returns can generate very different maximum drawdown levels depending on what order those returns arrive in. And so the preferred approach would be uh, to maximize how much you're getting in return versus the percentage chance of that strategy exceeding your drawdown threshold, like your personal pain tolerance. Yeah. But because that requires a lot of iterations, like you're going through, you know, 10,000, 10,000 different paths to get a good sense of what your drawdown might be probabilistically. Uh, I've actually just gone through and correlated that metric with a bunch of more popular metrics like Sharp Ratio, Sortino, um, Calmar, Profit Factor, like all the all the popular ones and Sharp Ratio just came out as the most correlated and it's very mm -hmm. easy to un calculate and understand. So I go with that one. <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, we've got a few more questions in the chat, which we might save for a little bit later, uh, because I know you've got a, um, do you have a couple of charts or examples you want to share with us, the type of research that you're doing just so that people are aware of, you know, uh, the practical aspects, I guess, of what we've been talking about today? Yeah, sure. Um, I think someone asked about, uh, I don't, am I sh my screen being shared or? Yeah, let me put it on now. It over? Here we go. Okay, there we go. So this is just a basic asset screener that I came up with. This gets updated every day at the close. <clears throat> um, and so these are just in things that I'm looking at if I'm trying to filter down um, like what assets should be traded. And so relative activity, this is. Uh, um, I've actually written an article about it for my uh, business that I run, Market Science. But this this actually has very strong correlations 
with a next day trend, uh, like trendiness versus choppiness. And then just basically, these are just uh, long-term, short-term momentum indicators. Uh, the range position is just where the market closed in relation to a three-day range. And then the predicted range, which is um, just a machine learning model output. Uh, so the predicted range for the next day, predicted highs and lows based on that range, and then correlations to Bitcoin and Ethereum, which are the two biggest cryptocurrencies and typically most assets in the space are correlated with these, but you can see there are some lower values. And so if you can, diversity is always a good thing to strive for. It's best to have um, assets that don't all track each other one for one, or you end up with a big concentrated portfolio. Um, so that's one thing I was looking at. So just to sorry to cut you off for a minute, just on that correlation thing. So I think one of the um, one of the appeals with cryptos is that there's this uh, idea that it's diversified to the stock market and and uh, index futures. What have you found in your research? Are they highly correlated, or can you get quite a good di diversification? Um, I did. I have actually done some research into this, but what I found was that it's pretty spurious. So I don't know. I don't see nearly as much talk about it as I did this time a year ago or mm. even a little before that, where there's a lot of people. Well, I guess I guess we'll have to wait and see. I think that <laughs> Bitcoin is correlated to traditional markets at certain times. Like last year, there was a lot of attention being drawn to the fact that the equities market and Bitcoin tracked very closely. And that was true even on very short time frames. So if you were looking at just an intraday chart of Bitcoin versus the S&P or the NASDAQ, they would track pretty closely. And I think it was just that large managers were treating Bitcoin as another risk asset, similar to equities. Mm -hmm. But then there were other times where it would track very closely with gold. And those relationships aren't always very consistent. So they tend to change. So I don't know. I think time will tell. I think we'd probably need more data to decide. But at the moment, I what I've seen is that it's very conditional. I think people, I think Bitcoin correlates with things when there's a strong narrative for it too. But I don't think yeah. there's anything structural that ties it to any traditional asset class. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Sorry, you can continue on. Okay, and then this is just another, this is for Bitcoin specifically. So this is something, it's just a report that's sent out to subscribers. But the relative volume and range, these are just comparing yesterday's range and volume to the averages over the past 20 days. And then just a probabilistic view of where the range for the day is expected to be. And so this just helps give a gauge of if it's overextended, those might be good areas to buy or sell based on just the belief that it shouldn't go much farther than that. And then this is something developed for more discretionary traders. I don't use levels or price action per se in my trading, but these are levels that have psychological significance to a lot of people. And so because of the speculative nature of crypto, they actually become somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy where if people believe that certain levels have importance, they end up having importance because people trade around those levels. And then these are just some simple systems and their historical performance. So any of these conditions that are being met at any time will show up in a filtered list. So you can see that based on the past, when the current day looked like it does, or when the market looked like it does today, uh, it's tend to outperform the buy and hold. 
And then one mm. feature that I thought was pretty cool, and this has not been systematized, but I just think it's interesting for people who trade more discretionarily is uh, fractals. And so this is in fractals in like a Mandel brought sense, or I guess like a higher level math sense. But people tell them to refer to fractals as patterns that repeat over time. And so this just uses uh, another machine learning algorithm to take the last 30 days worth of price activity and um, compare it to examples in the past and find instances where uh, the series of highs and lows and closes looked like it did in the recent past and then see how it performed. And then you can also see uh, where those instances lie historically. So if what the market looks like today looks like it did before major market tops or market bottoms, that could be valuable information. And then the same thing on a lower time frame basis. So those are just um, those are just some things that I look at on a daily basis um, and that uh, I think is valuable information. I'm not sure if there's anything else specifically yeah, that was um, that was very interesting. So thanks for sharing that. So um, there is a question in the chat actually about discretion, which which you just mentioned. Uh, so let me just put this up on the screen. It's from Mark. I'm just trying to find it in the chat. Here we go. Hey, Mark, good to see you here. Thanks for the question. I'd be interested to know where to start if I wanted to begin moving from a discretionary to a systematic approach trading cryptos. I think it I, I think that's a difficult question to answer. I, I think it depends on what you're currently doing. So I think a lot of people like I know a lot of people who trade discretionarily, um, but they they have systems and checklists in place. So I don't know many people who successfully trade, you know, just and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but like by the seat of their pants. So if, you, if you're if you trading discretionarily, but you're using indicators or you're using some kind of price patterns, um, I think the first thing I would do is try and systemize those or try and write out some series of conditions that you're looking for. You know, I would buy if X and Y and Z are all true um, and then sell if a is true or something something along those lines um so if you're trying to code up a specific strategy or trying to convert what you're doing now to systematic that's where i would start otherwise um i think there's a lot of great resources to get involved i think that systematic trading a book by robert carver who's been on the show a number of times is an awesome place to start um that that book really changed the way I think about trading and really lays out a nice framework for just how you should think about setting up a trading system. And then uh, a couple other good ones that I really like are um, Howard Bandy's books. So I think quantitative trading systems and quantitative technical analysis are really good uh, kind of in the same way for just thinking in systems terms and they lay out really well all the pieces that you need to be a good systematic trader, starting with um, what data you need, gathering data, organizing it correctly, uh, developing a system or generating signals, and applying those signals to the data that's coming in, and then turning those signals into actual orders for buys and sells in trades. So mm -hmm. those are those are probably the resources I would recommend. Yeah, okay. All right, I think one more uh, question before we finish up um, because we're about to uh, run out of time. We didn't really uh, get too much into your trading approach. I know um, you you like to have a look at uh, regimes quite a lot and in integrate them into your trading. And this final question is, is kind of along those lines, I guess, a little bit. It's from Dean. Um, let me put this one up on the screen. Are your strategies mainly long only? And no, I assume that's not. because, yeah, there's been a, a big run-up, big pull-up uh, market in crypto 
for quite a while, apart from the last maybe year or so. Um, does that tend to? I, I will say there. I used to have a bent towards uh, some like more market neutral or along those lines, and I actually made uh, a decent amount of money like in the early half of 2018 after the big run up. I didn't. I made more, I would say, in the sell-off after that like, bull market than I did um, during the bull market. But recently, I think it's been pretty hard to be short most things. So, I, like I said, the momentum is always, I think momentum is probably, probably should be the base for most strategies if they're going to be directional. So, as long as past momentum has been positive, uh, that's, I usually want to be long. Um, and because of the parabolic nature of a lot of assets, um, being long is usually more, well, I don't know. I don't know how I want to word this, but there is typically a more potential on the long side of anything because price can, there's no limit to how price can go up, but it can only go down a hundred percent. But yeah. short answer is no, I am not long only. Yep. All right. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much for the um, discussion today, Brian. Really appreciated you uh, sharing some of your insights into crypto. So if someone wanted to get in touch with you or learn more from you or even get access to those um, sample reports that you just showed us a few minutes ago, how can they do that? Sure. So I am on Twitter. My handle is Quant Fiction. So Q-U-A-N-T-F-I-C-T-I-O-N. I'm pretty active there. Usually the best way to get in touch with me is through Twitter DMs. Um, but I also have a website at markets science with two S's dot markets science dot com. <laughs> and I also have a blog at quantfiction.com. It's the same as my Twitter handle. I have not written an article there very recently, but I have some articles that I've written there if you want to read those as well. Yeah. All right. Excellent. All right. Thanks a lot, uh, Brian. Is there anything else you wanted to mention before we finish up for today? No. Uh, thanks for having me. It's been, I've listened to probably all these podcast episodes <laughs> and most of them multiple times. So it's really been an awesome opportunity for me to come on tonight. I really appreciate it. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot for contributing to the uh, the incredible list of guests we've had on the show so far. So um, yeah, really appreciate that. And thank you for everyone uh, for attending today. And we had some great questions in the chat and some good comments. So uh, don't forget to give us a, a big thumbs up on the video. And um, yeah, leave a comment if you want. Uh, I read all the comments there. And um, yeah, thanks again. And uh, Cheers, Brian. Uh, all the best, and we'll uh, catch up again soon, hopefully. I hope so. Thank you very much, Andrew. All right. Cheers. Yep. Have a good one. All right. Bye.